Hi, welcome to the Sidecars and Netflix presentation. Uh, I'm Rodrigo, I'm a software engineer at Kinfold. Uh, a little bit about me. I studied computer science in Argentina and I'm a maintainer of Metal B and Core Kubernetes Reviewer. And as I said, I work at Kinfolk. Uh, we are focused on developing open source software. Uh, you may know some of our projects like Flatcar Container Linux, uh, that is a container optimizer OS, or Headlamp, a Kubernetes Web UI, or Locomotive, a fully self-hosted Kubernetes distribution. Uh, today I'll be presenting with Manas, a software engineer at Netflix. He works on the Compute Infrastructure team on container execution, and we work together on the cycle ordering on the Qlet. Uh, the talk is divided in two parts. First, Manas will share uh, how Netflix is using sidecar containers, and in the second part, uh, I'll talk about the problems we face today with sidecars and the efforts we did to improve this situation in Kubernetes upstream. Hi, I'm Manas, and before we dive into sidecars, here is some background. At Netflix, our fleet is composed of more VMs, and Titus, our container platform, is gaining organic adoption. We are now working to make Titus the primary deployment target to give developers one well-supported infrastructure that allows them to iterate fast and is also more scalable and more efficient at the same time. The goal is to do this migration fast and automate as much as we can, so hundreds of platform engineers are not supporting two deployment targets for a very long time. To get a sense of what we are migrating, here is what a typical VM runs at Netflix. We have the application typically running in the JVM and a series of daemons providing service discovery, security, and observability to name a few things. Application developers expect these daemons to just work, and so we run them in an operationally sensitive fashion, by which I mean we start and shut them down in a specific order, restart them when they fail, and they are generally available to the application. As an example, the metrics forwarder starts up before the agent which boots tracked certificates. This is important because consider what happens when that agent starts failing. In our case, it can publish a metric to report these failures, and we can use our monitoring and alerting systems to track and remediate these. In the same way, the service mesh expects TLS certificates and the open policy agent to be available before it starts up. Otherwise, every application has to decide if the mesh needs to fail open or short circuit at startup. To do this, we run daemons as systemd units and use its DSL to get the ordering and restart policies we want. We also control the shutdown sequence with systemd, so a node is taken out of service discovery and connections get drained before we shut it down. Now, here is what a Titus host instance is running. The virtual kubelet launches an instance of Titus executor per container, and because Titus is multi-tenant, containers in different AWS accounts with different security groups and IAM roles run on a shared instance. We provide the functionality provided by daemons and VMs using what we call system services, uh, and alongside a few extra services we need, for example, we intercept instance metadata service on Titus. Finally, we have some software we use to manage the fleet. It might seem that the simplest way to run services is to run containers that look like VMs. But this means that we have to rebuild and redeploy containers when we want to replace system services. This impacts how fast we can react to security advisories or deploy hotfixes to these services, and we see these problems on VMs. Secondly, it is not possible for developers to import a container from Docker Hub and expect it to work on Titus in this setup. We want our developers to have this ability to experiment. Also, we cannot intercept the instance metadata servers or mount remote storage securely in this model. So perhaps we should run multi-tenant services on the host. This has no ordering issues and we might optimize some resource usage. We started by running a multi-tenant instance metadata service, as an example, but we learned very quickly that users can accidentally deploy workloads which query it in a tight loop. This starves other containers on the host, and if that loop is leaking connections, then our service runs out of file descriptors, and now we have a bad host. Another example is a log viewer, which used to be multi-tenant. 
and developers realize that the log viewer is a performant HTTP server. So why write your own when you can serve large files by writing them to the log volume? And as a platform, we want to be resilient to such resource sharing issues. The second problem is that we have workloads that expect to not be disrupted once they are running. This means all our system services will need to have the ability to hot reload and have perfect tenant isolation if these workloads are going to meet their SLAs. There are some more serious challenges when it comes to securing these multi-tenant services. Consider our multi-tenant log viewer, which serve logs for all containers, and someone figured out that relative paths work. We also allowed users to configure the metrics agent using a file in a volume, and the red team provided a handcrafted executable instead of a CSV. Now we have compromised the host instead of a container, and this is not acceptable. We feel it is difficult to anticipate all these issues and get perfect isolation and fault domains on multi-tenant services. So we write single tenant services and contain them with the workload. To that end, we have settled on a design where we give every container its own set of immutable system services. And usually this guarantees that once a container is set running, it will keep running. We tie the lifetime of the service to the container. So the service dies when the container dies. And a service also shares the identity, fault domains, and resources with the container. This means, for example, that the application and service mesh uh, share a cryptographic identity, namespaces, and C groups, which is almost always what our users expect. So how does Titus Executor run system services? It starts by creating the container using the image specified by the user and then it bind mounts data containers which package the system services into it. These are rootless containers in our system and that has its pros and cons. It also bind mounts a socket which we use to control the container and a few volumes and it does all of this in parallel. Next, it runs the container with the entry point set to teeny which immediately blocks. This creates the namespaces and C groups in which the system services will run uh, Tini is a tiny init for containers, which is used by Docker, and we use our own fork. Now the executor can set system services running with the correct ordering and restart policies, and we do this using systemd. These services are actually parameterized units, which are managed by the systemd running on the host. The information about which container to join is passed in files on the host by the Titus executor. And finally, we simply use run C to launch a process running inside the container. Now the service is running in the namespace and C group of the container, which means that the kernel will reap the service when the container dies. Once the sidecars are running, we release Tini using the socket and it runs the entry point as a child. Tini remains PID1 except in special cases and we use it to redirect standard output and error and also to do more advanced things with seccom notify as an example. Since Tini is not really optional the way we use it, Titus can avoid the overhead of pause containers. We just follow the reverse sequence when shutting down a container so services are always available. Uh, we don't have to worry about an application starting before the metadata service starts and crashing or the metadata service stopping before the application and causing the application to crash. I should point out that there are some special services like SSH where we don't use run C. There used to be a time when we ran docker exec to get a shell in the container, but that is insecure. Now we use a custom injector. This injector is a small C program. Again, we pass information about which namespaces to join via the environment. And the injector makes sure that it wears the correct app armor hat and change hat before it enters the container and launches the SSH server. With this work, we can use a real SSH server with all the bells and whistles, including the ability to SCP files to the instance, and that is nice. We do some similar advanced injection for mounting remote storage and intercepting the metadata service. And this way we can avoid running privileged containers or using IP tables connection tracking. And you can find more details in the Titus executor sources, which are open source. 
that brings us to how we version and upgrade the system services. For most workloads, the executor reads what the current stable version of sidecars is from a centralized store, and this happens at every container launch. This makes upgrading sidecars fast and simple. We change the configuration in the store and trigger a redeploy if required. And some jobs have more exacting SLAs, and they specify an exact version for a specific service. For example, applications in the streaming path might pin the service mesh. In this case, all containers in that Titus job get the pinned version. Some services are opt-in and there is a parameter on Titus job which says if a container gets that particular service or not. But broadly, it is an open problem for us how we go about managing and upgrading these services as we adopt a growing number of them to enable our de developers. The challenge in this space is pretty big and it's probably worthy of a discussion of its own. In summary, system services are pretty easy to implement using rootless containers. We get the benefit of being able to share mount and PID name spaces. So when a user logs into a container, they see a process tree and file system layout that makes sense. But we can only have one user container in our model. And we want to have more user containers to move towards more composable workloads. Although it is trivial to create these services in C or Go, it is not so easy to build a relocated statically linked SSH server. And currently we expect our partners to pay this tax alongside us if they want to run system services. Lastly, the debugging experience for these containers is terrible. You can't ship extra tools with these containers and debug symbols blew up the size of the static binaries which can make these containers a long pole in container start names. So what has this got to do with the kubelet? Titus started life as a Mesos cluster, but starting in 2019, we moved to virtual kubelet. My colleague Sargon talked about this in KubeCon San Diego. You can look at that talk. And over the past year, we have been adopting more Kubernetes components in the control plane like kube schedulers, CRDs, and controllers which do fleet management and usage-based scheduling as an example. So in 2020, we decided that we would try to migrate to the kubelet. Then we can run multiple user containers and get benefits of the Kubernetes ecosystem. But we ran into some problems. First, we need startup and shutdown ordering to run pods in our operational model. We have Teeny and we know how to write the Unix socket. So naturally we thought of building a coordinator using the webhook uh, and you get this contraction. This works, but we are not enthused about rewriting entry points to all containers when using the kubelet. We also looked around and found KEP 753 and decided we'd work with Rata to see how far we can get with two-phase ordering. Now, if we had that feature, some agents like the log viewer and aggregators or the open policy agent can start up before the application if we mark them as sidecars. We can even make the cryptographic bootstrap work by splitting it into an init container that generates the certificates and a sidecar that refreshes them. And then there are some system services like storage, which we can implement using a CSI and a metadata service, which we can implement using a CNI if we are willing to tweak our resource isolation a little bit. But we cannot make the metrics forward or start first or shut a pod down with connection draining till we have made some more progress on ordering. We will probably maintain some highly sophisticated injectors outside the kubelet and that is fine, but we don't want to build a contraction outside the kubelet or run an internal fork and risk maintaining it in perpetuity if the community pursues a different direction. In summary, we run sidecars in an operationally sensitive fashion and letting them crash is not an option for us. We also run an aggressive security posture using user namespaces, seccomp and app armor. And there have been cases where one of these was the final thread between us and an attacker. So we cannot compromise here. Finally, we like our single tenant services. They are easy to write and run reliably. 
I want to wrap up by saying that we want to move towards a more composable pod with sidecars and multiple user containers. And we could use the kubelet to get there if it had ordering and user namespace support. So now over to Rata for more about the kubelet. Hi, uh, I'll now explain what are the problems that we have with sidecar containers in Kubernetes today and the efforts we did in Kubernetes action to improve this. Before we start, let me say that Kubernetes knows nothing about sidecar containers today. Kubernetes treats all containers in the same way. The distinction between sidecar and main containers is useful only for us, uh, at least for now. So uh, let's see some problems we have today. If Kubernetes doesn't really know anything about sidecars, um, I'll use a service mesh for several examples, uh, but these problems are not limited to a service mesh. They affect the vast majority of sidecar containers. So one problem that we face today is that there is no startup order warranties. The main container can be started uh, before the sidecars, and when that happens, the window between the main containers is started until the sidecar is ready is the window where the problems usually arise. For example, uh, if the sidecar is a service mesh, all network connections will be black hole until the service mesh container is ready. Uh, this is not a minor problem, and workarounds are not great, quite the opposite. A workaround in some cases, for example, is to do nothing. Uh, let's say your container uh, crashes when sidecars are not ready. If you do nothing, your container will crash until the sidecars are ready, and the next time it is restarted, it will work. Uh, this can be slow though, and if your sidecar depends on some other sidecars, they can, this can get easily super slow. And this will be a problem you, you face to scale up when traffic increases, for example. Uh, another workaround is to change your container entry point. For example, you can change it uh, with a script that waits for other sidecars to be ready and only then starts the main process in the container. An example of this is the linkerd await command uh, that waits for linkerd to become ready and then executes uh, your container process. This has a lot of downsides, uh, becomes, in, becomes impossible with a lot of sidecars and we fail the promise of augmenting the functionality without changes to the main container. The container are completely coupled uh, right now if we do this. Um, something similar happens on shutdown. There are no order warranties on shutdown either, uh, so the sidecar can terminate before the main application. And this is a big problem for several scenarios. Let's say the sidecar is a service mesh again. If the service mesh is killed before your main container, we won't be able to gracefully finish in flight connections uh, because we can use the network. And this is a big problem. Uh, workarounds we have are from, far from good, far from good uh, too. Like doing a slip to delay being killed or ignoring sick term or just losing some traffic. All, work on, all workarounds have big downsides. Um, another problem that I want to talk about is that we can't use sidecar containers with a job today. A job is a pod that runs until completion. Uh, it, co it computes something and finish, uh, like the first 100 digits of pi. Uh, and it usually works like this. The container starts, computes something and finish. Therefore, all container exits successfully and Kubernetes proceeds to clean up the pod. However, if we are using a, a service mesh, for example, we start the pod with two containers now, the main container and the service mesh. The main container finishes, but the sidecar won't finish, and it will never finish because it is a daemon. Therefore, therefore, the pod continues to run forever and will never be cleaned up. Sim uh, similar problems arise when we take into account init containers, because init containers also run into completion. Um, but let's not go into the details of those now. Uh, we can read them in the cap linked at the end of the presentation if you want. So uh, those are the problems uh, we currently have with Sidecar. Uh, but now let me tell you about the Kubernetes enhancement proposal uh, we work on to improve the situation. A cap is a document that describes uh, any enhancement made to Kubernetes. And the Sidecar cap uh, that add the notion of sidecar containers to Kubernetes has a long history. It was created in 2018 by Joseph Irving and it started a big discussion in the community about the different ways that can be pursued to solve these issues uh, we just talked about. 
I joined the sidecar effort in May 2020 and we really try to do what, what is best for the community so uh, we reach out to as much people as possible to make sure what we propose in the cap worked for all, for, for all and not only for us. Uh, and as a side note, uh, by reaching out, uh, I found out that several companies today are using a Kubernetes fork just to add the concept of sidecar containers. I was really surprised about this, um, but it helped me to convince myself that this is a problem we need to solve in some way or the other. And so as I was saying, we, we invested a lot of time and effort in this. Uh, we met with these companies, but we also met with developers from Linkerd and Istio, and we did a bunch of other things, like uh, make sure the Kubelet graceful shutdown cap interacts properly with the sidecar cap. Uh, we did a detailed analysis of some edge cases that were a major concern for Signode and we found some design issues and bugs that exist in the CAP and PR that weren't noticed in the past two years. After all of this, uh, we, inc we improved the CAP to address all concerns raised by Signode and companies using sidecars in their own fork. It was not easy, but we found a way forward with reasonable trade-offs. Sadly, there was a catch. The, the original CAP uh, focus on doing a simple change, just adding the concept of sidecar containers. And after much uh, discussion and deliberation, it became clear that this would cha uh, this change would leave out too many use cases that would require significant uh, additional work in the future. So in October 2020, together with the Signode community, we decided to reject the original cap and work on something completely different uh, to solve more use cases. Some of the ideas uh, that we might want to explore on, on a more radical cap include something like use run levels for container startup or termination, or, or even add an explicit container to container dependencies, like container A depends on container B. Um, so the startup of, the, of a pod looks like a graph now. So we decided to, to reject this cap and start from scratch also. Uh, like really from scratch. We decided to start collecting use cases for things that are not properly supported in Kubernetes today and sketch some high-level ideas or pre-proposals. Uh, we have done that and we have one proposal by Tim Hawking. Uh, the idea is to later choose with the community which proposal should turn in, into a cap. Looking back, uh, we made good progress. We have documented uh, a lot of use cases we can now use to create proposals and I really want to thank everyone that helped by adding their use case there. Uh, this journey also helped to clarify that sidecars are somehow important to Kubernetes and that we don't want to make minimal changes. We want something that probably solves the problem. And that opens the door not only for bigger changes but also for better support not just fixing the most obvious use cases that need to work, but also allow more complex container dependencies within the pod. Overall, uh, this is clearly a big, very, very big project and we've come a long way, but even though it is far from finished now. Uh, and with this, we're at where, where we are today. We're at this pre-cap stage Joseph moved on. Uh, sadly, I don't expect to have the time to move this from the pre-cap stage we currently are at all the way into a cap and later to a GA feature. But uh, I spent a lot of time on this and would like to help. So let me know if I can help to review some proposal or give some general input. Luck luckily, uh, Matthias from the community has volunteered to continue to drive this forward and I want to thank him again for this. Um, and yeah, so to close, regarding sidecar usage, uh, we show four uh, problems with sidecars that don't have a, a reasonable workaround today. And this is making some companies fork the Kubelet, like Pinterest and Lyft uh, have their public forks on GitHub. Netflix is also a diversion, as Manus showed, uh, using the virtual Kubelet. Um, sidecar seems to be a big win for others too. Uh, it's a big win for Linkerd and Istio in the software launch. Uh, it's also, it seems Tecton, the Google CI/CD, will also benefit from this as, as they mentioned in the presentation at Kube, KubeCon 2019, especially if we add more advanced features. And regarding improving sidecar support in Kubernetes, we're at this pre-cap stage uh, and we expect uh, a cap out of the proposal to improve the situation. Here are the links for all the things that we mentioned in the presentation. Um, 
Thank you very much. Uh, we're really ready to take some questions now.